May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. <coughs> James, the book of James. For those of you who um, haven't been with us for the last few weeks, we've been doing a sermon series on the book of James. And it's been quite hard hitting, hasn't it? It's been quite full on. We've looked at um, we kind of, the first week, Caleb kicked us off with looking at the, the seriousness of our sin, that we've actually got a lot of muck in us, and we are uh, invited into this um, journey of transformation. We looked at this um, well-known verse, that faith without deeds is dead, which you need to be activating our faith. We looked at this idea that showing favoritism to the wrong thing to <coughs> Jesus is so detrimental. And then last week, Caleb talked about um, our tongue and how powerful our words are and how damaging our words can be when we speak over people's lives. These words of James were written back in the first century, but they are as relevant to us today as they were back then. And the reason why James is so hard-hitting is because he deeply, deeply desires that God's people would be wholehearted for Jesus, that they would live wholehearted lives sold out for Jesus. Have this image of what I think James is a little bit like. I think it's a bit like a root canal. Has anyone ever had a root canal? Really, really painful. And the thing is, is that it's so painful, it's so painful to get extracted, but then it's gone. And yes, it is painful in the moment, and when you've got it, but actually to live with that root canal for the rest of your life would be dreadful, wouldn't it? And I feel like James is a little bit like that. It is painful, some of the stuff that James highlights to us about the way that we live our lives. But actually, if we don't confront it and live into it and live into this whole heart of Jesus life, that root canal is just going to keep lingering. <coughs> So our final part of our James series today is we're going to be looking at James chapter 4, 1 to 10 that Nolene just shared to us. And I've got quite a structured sermon for us. If you've got your Bibles, it will be quite easy for us to follow through. <coughs> what we've got is James setting up in verses 1 to 5. I'm going to highlight to us three of the problems that we as humans have that James highlights for us. We're then going to look at, right in the middle of the verses, verse 6, there's a provision that Jesus says that he's giving us to help us with all that muck. And then we're going to move into the practical stuff, which I always love, because it's about life. We need to actually be able to apply all of this stuff in our life. And I'm going to look at some things that James highlights that we can do in response to recognising that muck. So, the problem... He is recognising that among the Christian people, there's a lot of fighting going on. There's a lot of quarrelling. Those fights and disputes among you, where do they come from? Where does fighting come from? Why do we fight? Why do we get irritable with people? As many of you know, Caleb and I live in community. And on Monday nights, every Monday night, as a house, we gather for leadership and discipleship training. And we have spent a lot of time looking at what healthy conflict looks like. Because conflict in and of itself is not a bad thing. It is not bad for somebody to have a different opinion to another person. It's not bad that when Caleb and I sit down to play a board game, that I want to eat a bag of barbecue kettle chips. And he wants to eat a block of Whitaker's peanut butter chocolate. And that's not a bad thing. He likes sweet, I like savoury. Who are the savoury people in the house? Chips over chocolate, the rest of you chocolate people. So it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing that when Caleb and I want to watch a movie together, that he wants the action boy movie, and I want the epic drama or the chick flick. What is bad though, is if the scenario goes like this. Hey, honey, do you want to watch a movie? Um, yeah. I guess we're gonna to have to watch one of your boy movies. I guess you won't be happy, you won't enjoy your evening if we watch one of my movies. I guess we'll have to watch one of your movies. It's all right, honey, marriage is about compromise, right? And then sigh or through the movie. That wouldn't be okay, would it? We've got differing opinions. 
death, but I'm not responding in a very nice way. When the cup is knocked, what comes out? And Caleb touched on this last week. When we're not, when a differing opinion comes, what we like, what comes out is our response. Exactly, what is inside us. We all know that unhealthy conflict and fighting comes from battles that we have within ourselves, right? And we often take out those battles on somebody. It's often those that we love the most. Conflict progresses into fighting because we have a lack. Because we are lacking something. James says, verse 2, And you want something and you do not have it, so you kill. You covet something, but you cannot have it, so you quarrel. When Caleb and I did marriage preparation, we were told again and again the importance of good communication. And I would say the same thing to couples getting married. Communication is so key. And we were given lots of tools and exercises to help us in our marriage that when we had conflict or whatever, that we had these tools to fall on to help us get through the conflict and through and having good communication. The thing is though, if these tools and exercises don't actually help us deal with the muck that is going on inside, they're just tools. The other night, Sunday night, I got home from a very long day and I just really wanted to get the washing folded and put away before I went to bed, right? I had a really long day, church in the morning, meeting in the afternoon, prayer and praise in the evening, and we're in the middle of toilet training, our three-year-old. So it's been a really full-on day. But I get home, I'm really tired, and I'm like, Caleb, please, can I just get this washing folded and the clothes horse away before I go to bed? So I go over to the clothes source, and I don't know if any of you know the, the white ones that you kind of have to pull up and then clip into place, there's lots of layers to them. Anyway, my clothes source was absolutely covered, every single little that was covered with clothing. But I thought actually, this it would be better if my clothes source was by the dining room table because then I'd have a surface to fold everything on instead of, you know, putting the folded clothes on the couch. Arms and falling off and stuff. Anyway, so I don't know if you've ever tried moving a full clothes source by yourself. It's like, you position it like this and then you're kind of shuffling and you're moving your lower back. Anyway, as I was shuffling, one of the like latches came undone and clothes started slipping off and I was so annoyed but I just kept shuffling so I was like, I just need to get this thing down anyway. I put it down, I reattached the latch and I go back to pick up the clothes that have fallen off and as I pick them up they're really damp. And I'm like, I can't even fold them because they're not dry, I should have just left them and gone to bed. Anyway, I walk back over to the clothes source and I put my clothes back on the thingy and I'm just about to go to bed and I'm like, oh. I put the clothes source like kind of a little bit over the toilet, the entrance to the toilet door. And we live in community, so people getting up in the middle of the night, they won't know that I put it there, it will be in the way. So, <laughs> I go to do the awkward thing. And as I go, <laughs> shirt rips <laughs> on a piece of the rusty like latch thing. It's my new clerical shirt that my mum has made for me, and it's ripped. And I'm just feeling so annoyed and so pent up. And all of a sudden, I'm like so annoyed with the person because we live in a community. I don't know whose thing this was. I was like so annoyed at the person for letting their clothes source get rusty. <laughs> and then I was so annoyed at the world for not realizing how busy my life is and how much washing I've got. And I just want my washing done. <coughs> and then it occurs to me. It's Caleb's fault that my shirt ripped. <laughs> <laughs> so I march down to our bedroom and I say, Caleb, my shirt is ripped. You know what his response was? It's dear. Yes, Honey, dear. I'm afraid to tell you, but there's also a rip in the back. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me that when I presided that Sunday morning, when I walked up, he was like, he noticed there was a rip in the back. I was like, that is not helpful. I was like, serious. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all of that was a little bit annoying, but my response was way disproportionate to what had actually happened. What was happening inside me was a massive control issue. 
when I really sat and thought about it, I was like, I'm actually feeling quite stressed about the next two few weeks with Hui and with church moving away and just life. And because I didn't feel like I had control over those things, I was like, I can control the washing. I can get them into a nice neat pile and put away. I can control over something. I also realised this yuck thing that was happening inside me. So I have this silly comparison thing with my sister-in-law who lives in the UK, who, <laughs> um, who's got two kids, and she irons all of their clothes. And they always look very fresh and beautiful. And I'm like, how do you do that? I can't even keep on top of my own washing. But I was like, why is that even a thing? Anyway, I've just got this quote I wanted to have a look at. All our dreams are like an armed camp within us, ready at a moment's notice to declare war against anyone who stands in the way of some personal gratification on which we have set our hearts. <coughs> read it again. All of our dreams are like an armed camp within us, ready, ready inside, at a moment's notice, when the rip happens on my shirt, to declare war against anyone who stands in the way of some personal gratification, getting my washing done before I go to bed, on which we have set our hearts. What are the things that we set our hearts on? What is it that we are actually passionate about? What are our passions? Being in control of my washing? Cooking? Sports? Politics? When things don't go the way we want, how do we respond? What comes out? If our primary passion, and I feel like I say this in every service, there's nothing wrong with sports and politics and washing and cooking, but if our primary passion are these things, that's not okay. Our primary passion should be Jesus. If our passion is seeking his way, if our passion is seeking the kingdom of God, if our passion is pursuing being people like Jesus, pursuing kindness and gentleness and self-control and humility, can you imagine what would come out if we are not, if they are our passions, if they are the things that we are cultivating inside? Beautiful stuff would come out, wouldn't it? That's our first problem. We have quarrelling and fighting amongst us because when we are in lack of something that we have set our hearts on, we don't respond very well a lot of the time. That's our first problem that James highlights for us. Our second problem, which I think is pretty closely linked, is because so often we lose friendship with the world. That's a classic phrase here at church services about friendship with the world. But actually, what we spend our time doing, watching, influences our passions. If we are friends with the ways of the world and not the ways of Jesus, that friendship is going to be what's influencing what we're thinking about and our passions. Those are the things that are going to be fueling our passions and what's happening inside. I am constantly shocked by what is okay to be on our movie screens and our TV screens. The murder, the swearing, the guns, the violence, the explicit sex scenes. The storylines of poor people being raised up in an elevator because they are now famous in the world's eyes. Storylines of crude and superficial love. We've got to be careful what we are spending our time doing and how that's influencing what's happening on the inside. That's our second problem, choosing friendship with the world. And the third problem that, he, that I want to highlight that James says is that you do not have because you do not ask. You do not have because you do not ask. 
And we do not ask because we are distracted. Every fortnight, Caleb and I meet with other clergy in our parish, and we all alternate with Bishop Justin and Stuart leading our leadership training sessions. And at the beginning of every one of those sessions, we have a time of the prophetic. We set apart 10 minutes and we sit in a circle and we literally, in silence, we give two minutes to wait on the Holy Spirit to give us a prophetic word of encouragement for the person sitting on our left. Every single time we do it, every single person has a prophetic word of encouragement for somebody. That is 10 minutes from my day. And you know why we've received those prophetic images? Because we've asked. And we've been intentional about setting that time apart to wait on Jesus. Because we have asked, we have received. The things that hinder our prayer lives, that hinder us asking, is that often we ask with wrong motives, or we simply give up praying because we forget and we get distracted, or because we choose to live in unforgiveness. So these are our problems, there's good stuff coming. That we fight and quarrel, that we choose friendship with the world, <coughs> and we don't receive because we don't ask. We're distracted. <coughs> but, oh my goodness, and this is a beautiful but, an amazing but, in verse 6. But he gives more grace. Not just he gives grace, he gives more grace. Just think about this for a moment. I'm not sure um, quite what the right illustration is, but maybe think of a child or a spouse or a friend or a sibling who hasn't been acting so nicely towards you. That, that conflict, that quarreling has just got out of hand and you're in a state of not healthy relationship. Would your response be more grace to that person? Would it be more grace when they treated you terribly? Here's Jesus standing, seeing his children, his sons and his daughters, fighting and quarreling amongst themselves, seeking things from the world. Um, never really talking to him and his response to his sons and his daughters I love you and I give you even more grace because I so desperately want you to turn from your ways that's his response it's incredible it is so humbling there is a posture for us over here receiving this grace it's not a but, it's an and. That we receive this grace in a posture of humility. Because actually we can only receive it if, we're, if we receive it, you know what I mean? As in we've actually got to acknowledge that that's what we need and that's what we want. And the way we receive it is in a posture of humility. James says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Jesus never forces anything on us. Our posture needs to be humility to receive and to walk in this grace. And so to the third section over here, the prescription. How do we how do we walk in this grace? What does it look like for us to humble ourselves? James says in verse 7, submit yourselves to God. Submit yourselves, submit your ways to God. What you think at the moment is there something in your life that you need to release to Jesus that you need to say actually Jesus I want you to have your way in this part of my life actually we want it to be all our lives but I just I feel if there's something particular that is resonating for you as I'm saying this to seriously consider releasing that to Jesus it might feel scary, it might feel like you're out of like you're control over it. But he's the safest person to submit your ways to. So verse 7, submit yourselves to God. We say, you get to have the say, Jesus. Not me, not other people, not the world. You get to have the say. 
Verse 7 goes on to say that we are to resist the devil. We are to resist temptation. We are to resist the ways of the world. And the thing about resist is that it is a verb. Verbs are action words. It actually requires us to partake in the action of resisting the enemy. Resisting these things that we get caught up in. It requires discipline. It requires us to actually resist it. So we're to submit our ways to God to resist the devil. In verse 8, I love this one. The invitation from James is for us to draw, draw near to God. Because when we draw near to God, He draws near to us. It kind of ties in with that um, the thing I was saying. We do not ask, we do not receive because we do not ask. But there is that promise that when we draw near to Him, He draws near to us. Isn't that such a beautiful image? And the thing about this is that with this promise, there is protection and there is presence. Because when we draw near to Him and we resist the enemy, there is protection in His wings. There is protection. And when we draw near to him, he draws near to us, so there is his presence. There is protection and there is presence. And this is where I want to highlight again our week in prayer. Because I often, and I hear myself saying this, I just don't have time to have my quiet times. I just I get through my days and I forget to draw near. I forget to pray. I'm des- my, my sort of thing last week was I was I was desperate for a drink from the Spirit. And actually, this space here, if you sign up, we ask you to sign up for an hour slot. Can I ask you to at least sign up to one slot this week and use this space as an oasis where you are free of distraction and you're given permission, in a sense, to come and to pray for an hour and to soak in His presence. We've got six spaces available this afternoon that need to be filled. I'm asking six people, and it doesn't matter if there's more than one person signed up. This is a sacred space, and this is an invitation for us to respond now and draw near to Jesus. And I promise you, he will draw near to you. Verse 8. So we've got submitting ourselves to God, resisting the devil, draw near to God. Verse 8. Repent from our sins. Wash our hands and purify our hearts. James then says this funny thing, which I was a bit like, what? When I read it, in verse 8, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and our joy to gloom. What? Does anyone else find that confusing? <laughs> when the joy of the Lord is supposed to be our strength and we're told to think of whatever is pleasing and right and beautiful and good. Why is he telling us? Why is James saying, turn your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom? How depressing. But as I sat with those verses for a bit, I was like, what James is saying, is he's just trying to make a point here. That actually if we continue to walk in, um, in our ways, justifying terrible things that we do, and pretending when things are deluded, when actually we are continuing to choose to not draw near to him, to seek after things of the world, to try and control our own lives. That that is shocking. It is not the invitation of fullness that Jesus offers. James is so, so desperate for Christians, for God's people to be wholehearted for him. And that's why he's saying, turn that laughter to mourning. You do not realize, you do not realize James finishes by saying, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So what does that humbling look like? It looks like all those things I just talked about. It looks like us submitting ourselves to his ways. It looks like resisting the enemy. It looks like us drawing near to Jesus. And it looks like us repenting of our wrong ways. So let us walk in humility and continue in the posture of humility as we receive his protection, his life, his presence, 
a wholehearted, good, life and abundance way of life. I'm going to lead us now into a time of engaging with our prayer stations. We're just going to take probably about 10 minutes for this, so don't feel stressed.